the last speaker of this session is Alex Kersner, who is going to talk about fast simulation of planar uh, Clifford circuits. So Alex, uh, please put up your slides. So you are muted, by the way. OK, great. I should be unmuted now. Yes. All right. So uh, this is joint work with David Gossett and Daniel Greer and Luke Schaefer. So if I can advance the slide here, there we go. OK, so broadly speaking, this talk is about classical simulation. So I'd like to start out with the most basic type of classical simulation task you might be interested in. So in this task, you're given some input state, and then you're given a quantum circuit, and your goal is to sample from the output distribution. Now, you can always do this in, you can always do this classically, of course. You can just represent the input state as a big vector with two to the n uh, entries. And then you can think of each unitary gate as a sparse matrix. And you can just work your way through the circuit performing all these space, uh, sparse matrix vector multiplications over and over again. If you do this, you're going to get a runtime that scales like 2 to the n times the number of gates, which is pretty inefficient. So I'd like to present our first result as kind of a combination of these two better algorithms that you can get when you, can, when you consider restricted classes of circuits. OK, so the first restricted class of circuits I want to talk about, um, it comes from this idea of Markov and Xi. And what they do is they provide an algorithm where if you map your circuit to a graph in the obvious way, so you replace every gate with a vertex and every wire segment with an edge, then they provide a simulation algorithm that runs in time exponential in the tree width of the graph uh, rather than two to the n. So you might not know what tree width is. I'll define it a little bit later on in the talk. But for now, you should just know that it's some graph theoretic measure. And for planar graphs, the tree width is at most the square root of the number of vertices. So consequently, if you have, let's say, a constant depth circuit that is arranged in this planar way, then you can simulate it in time that scales like 2 to the root n instead of 2 to the n. So you get a quadratic speed up. OK, so this is idea number one, is just looking at circuit geometry. And we want to combine this idea with known techniques for Clifford circuit simulation. So in a Clifford circuit, remember, you're allowed to input the all zero state, and then you're only allowed to apply gates from this limited gate set. And the gottesman knill theorem tells us that these circuits can be efficiently simulated on a classical computer. And the way that this was originally presented and the way that we do it in our paper is through the stabilizing formalism. So there are a few other ways that you can do this, uh, but I'm not going to talk about those. All of the different simulation methods come down to finding an efficient representation for the input state and then finding a way to update that representation efficiently whenever you apply a gate or add on a new qubit or perform a measurement. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the exact polynomial complexity uh, of these operations. So if you want to apply a gate using the stabilizer formalism, you can do that in time that scales like n. And if you want to measure a single qubit, you can do this in time n squared. And of course, if you want to measure all of the qubits, you can just do this n squared protocol n times. One improvement that I'm not really going to talk about, but I do want to mention, is that uh, we show that all of these operations can be handled through uh, matrix operations and matrix multiplication. So if you want to measure all of the qubits, you can, do, you can actually do this in time n to the omega, where omega is the matrix multiplication constant that's somewhere between 2 and 2.37 something. And then we also show that if you want to apply an arbitrary number of CZ gates in one shot, so this, there could be as many as, of, as many as n squared of them. You can do that in the same runtime. OK, so I've put this red box around n to the omega because in this talk, I'm going to be saying something to the power of omega a lot. So I just want to say now that in this talk, anything you could possibly want to do with Clifford, uh, Clifford circuits and stabilizer states, you can do in time n to the omega. That's going to be our blanket upper bound 
Okay, so we'll go back to the main thread here. We were trying to combine ideas of geometry and, and Clifford circuits. So our first result is as follows. If you have a Clifford circuit in which the two qubit gates act along the edges of a planar graph, then you can sample from the output distribution in time n to the omega over two, and then there's also this cost that depends on the depth. So in particular, for constant depth circuits, remember I said on the last slide that anything you could possibly want to do, you can do in time n to the omega. So this is a quadratic improvement on that, which itself was some small polynomial improvement uh, over the previous best results. Okay, so we actually don't spend very much time in the paper discussing this problem. We spend the bulk of our paper discussing another problem uh, to which we reduce this one. So now I'm gonna talk about this second problem, uh, which involves graph states. So if you have a graph, you can form this associated graph state by replacing every vertex with a qubit in the plus state. And then for every edge in the graph, you apply a CZ gate between the corresponding qubits. And the problem that we really spend the bulk of our time considering is this thing called the graph state simulation problem. And in this problem, you're given as input a graph, and then for every vertex, you're given some Pauli basis, x, y, or z. And the task is just to sample, is to simulate a measurement on that graph state in the designated Pauli basis. So in this equation, u basis is a change of basis operator. It's a tensor product of local operators. Okay, so why should you care about graph state simulation? Well, one reason you might be interested is it's known that uh, adaptive arbitrary measurements on grid graph states are universal for quantum computation. This is measurement-based quantum computing. And if you restrict yourself only to Pauli measurements, then you can get all of the Clifford circuits as well. And so the reduction from the previous problem about planar Clifford circuits to the graph state simulation problem just goes through this, uh, this measurement-based idea. Okay, the graph state simulation problem in particular has also been considered uh, on grid graphs by Ravi Gossett Koenig. And they show that while a quantum algorithm can solve this problem in constant depth, any classical algorithm that solves it must have at least logarithmic depth. So this is uh, log n. And one of the reasons why we were interested in studying this problem further was that we wanted to see whether there was also an advantage in terms of gate complexity. Uh, in addition to depth. So on a quantum computer, the most obvious way to solve this problem is just prepare the graph state and measure it. And if you do this, you'll get a runtime, you'll get a, you'll get a gate complexity, excuse me, uh, that scales like the number of edges plus the number of vertices. And so in particular, planar graphs, which have only a linear number of edges, can be, uh, can be solved in time O of n. So the second major theorem is that we provide an algorithm that solves the graph state simulation problem on planar graphs in time n to the omega over two. So again, this is a quadratic improvement over just the naive algorithm, which itself was a, a small polynomial improvement over the previous best algorithm. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to now describe our algorithm for solving the graph state simulation problem. As a warm up, I want to consider the special case where the graph is the grid graph. So, how would we do this classically? Well, we could start by initializing in our representation all n qubits. So, red in this picture means uh, that the qubits are being stored in memory. And then we can simulate the application of all of the CC gates. And remember, I said any operation you could possibly want to do, you can do in this time n to the omega. And then we can also, in the same runtime, simulate measurements on all of the qubits. So of course, our runtime is going to be roughly n to the omega. But this algorithm turns out not to be optimal. And I'm now going to present a better algorithm. So this algorithm is recursive. And what we're going to recursively do is well, we're going to split up the grid into four quadrants, and then on each quadrant, quad, quadrant, excuse me, uh, we're going to initialize all of the qubits 
And then we're also going to simulate applications of all of the gates that act between these qubits. And then for all of the qubits on the interior of this subgrid, we're going to measure them. So I forgot to mention in this picture, blue means the qubit has been measured and it's no longer being stored in our representation. Okay, so everything on the interior has been measured, which means that we're only storing these red qubits in memory. But since the side length of this grid is root n, we only have a, co a constant times root n number of qubits being stored. And similarly, there are only a constant times root n number of qubits that remain to be initialized because there's root n here and there's root n here. And similarly on the window frame shape, but now, since we only have root n qubits hanging around, we're off to the races. We can just do everything in the naive way. We can simulate the application of all of the gates, and that's going to take time root n to the omega. And then we can simulate measurements on everything in the interior of the grid, and that's again going to take time uh, n to the omega over 2. And then finally, we can finish up the recursion if we're at the last step by measuring everything on the boundary. So our total runtime is given by this recurrence relation. And if you just solve this recurrence relation, you see that the n to the omega over 2 term dominates. OK, and uh, I should say first that this idea is, is pretty similar to the nested dissection strategy for solving systems of linear equations. So what makes this idea work? Well, the key idea is just to minimize the number of qubits that are stored in memory at any given time. because the number, the, the runtime depends on the number of qubits being stored in memory, so we should try to minimize that. All this approach comes down to is scheduling which operations to perform and when, right? All we did was we chose which qubits to initialize and then which gates to apply. It was all about finding a clever ordering. And so we tried to generalize this approach of finding a clever ordering, and we thought maybe for any planar graph, there's always a clever ordering. Um, and although we weren't able to rule it out, we also weren't able to show that one exists. So in order to introduce our algorithm in general, I have to introduce this thing called a treaty composition. All right, so on the left, I have a graph, and on the right, I have a treaty composition of that graph. And a treaty composition consists of a set of bags, which are all subsets of the vertex set, and they're arranged in a tree, and there are three rules that you have to follow. So the first rule is that every vertex has to appear in at least one bag. The second rule is that the endpoints of every edge have to appear together in at least one bag. And then the third rule is that if you look at any particular vertex and you look at the bags that contain that vertex, they have to be connected. Okay, so I talked a little bit about tree width earlier at the earlier in the talk. So I'll say that the tree width of a, of a, or sorry, the width of a tree decomposition is the size of the biggest bag minus one. And we say that the tree width of the graph is just the minimum over all tree decompositions. And a big reason why our algorithm works uh, particularly well for planar graphs is because planar graphs have a tree width at most square root of the number of vertices. And on top of that, you can also come up with the tree decomposition efficient. Okay, and you should think of the tree decomposition as giving us our schedule of which operations to perform and when. That's the intuition behind why we're going to use a tree decomposition. Okay, so at the heart of our algorithm is a mapping from a tree decomposition to a circuit. So I have, again, here I have the same graph. This time I have a different tree decomposition. And there are a few things that I want to point out about this treaty composition. So the first thing is that it's rooted. And so we're going to use this rooting uh, to give a direction to our circuit. So our circuit is, gonna, is going to move from the leaves towards to the root. The other thing to notice is that there are basically only three types of bags or nodes. And what we're going to do is we're going to form our circuit by replacing each node with a particular type of circuit gadget. And then we're going to glue all of those gadgets together so that they have the exact same structure as the tree. Okay, so the first type of node is an introduce node. And in this type of node, there is a vertex that appears in the node 
that does not appear anywhere farther down the tree. So in particular, leaf nodes definitely satisfy this condition because there's nothing at all down the tree. What we're going, the, the corresponding gadget is going to be, is going to consist of initializing all of the new qubits to the plus state. This should make sense because eventually we want to produce a graph state, which means we have to initialize some qubits to the plus state eventually. The second type of node is kind of the opposite. You can see that qubit A or vertex A appears in the child of this node, but does not appear in the node itself. And so the corresponding gadget is going to be for every edge in the graph that is incident to A, we're going to apply the corresponding controlled Z gate. Again, this should make sense because we want to produce a graph state, which means we have to apply these CZ gates. And by the connectivity property of tree decompositions, we know that vertex A is not going to appear anywhere else. So we have to apply these CZ gates now. It's our last chance. The last type of node is the trickiest. So this is called a merge node. And this occurs when the node is equal to the union of its children. Now, you might have noticed that in the previous two cases, we have this feature in our circuit in which some qubits are duplicated. So we have a qubit corresponding to vertex C, and we have another qubit corresponding to vertex C. And the way that we deal with this duplication is through this merge gadget. So we apply a C0 gate, and then we measure. And you can show that if you get measurement result zero, then it will implement this map, which essentially merges the two C qubits into one. And you can also show that if you get the right measurement result at all of these gadgets, so this guy and also this guy in this case, then the state on the remaining qubits, so qubit A and qubit B and qubit C and so on, the state on the remaining qubits will be exactly the graph state of the graph that you're interested in. So what we can do is we can simulate the circuit, and whenever we reach the end of a wire for, let's say, qubit A, we can measure in its designated Pauli basis. And when we reach the end of the wire for a merge qubit, we can just measure in the computational basis. What we're going to do is first we're going to simulate the circuit, and we're not going to worry about the post-selection, and then we'll go back and correct the post-selection. So how would we simulate the circuit? Well, the key idea is to just do it in the laziest way possible. So notice that you can simulate this portion of the circuit and this portion of the circuit completely independently. And once you've measured qubit A, you can remove it from your representation. And similarly, once you've measured qubit E, you can remove that from your representation. And so if you go up the circuit just simulating gadget by gadget, you'll only ever have to handle a number of qubits in memory that is roughly equal to the size of the bag. It's actually the size of the bag plus its children. And so what will be the runtime of simulating the gadget corresponding to a given bag? Well, remember, I, I'm sounding like a broken record, but you can simulate, you can simulate that gadget in a time that scales like the size of the bag to the power of omega. And so you get the total simulation time by summing over all of the bags. Now, it's not immediately clear what this sum evaluates to, but one thing that you can show is that if you, if you have a planar graph, you can come up with a tree decomposition for which this sum evaluates to n to the omega over 2, as promised. For non-planar graphs, of course, this algorithm still works, and we get this runtime n times the tree width to the omega minus 1. But the problem is that for non-planar graphs, it's hard to get a tree decomposition to begin with. So we assume that it's given to us at the beginning of the algorithm. OK, so the only loose end that I still need to tie up is this business with the post-selection. Remember, we needed to get the right measurement result here. And the way that we handle that is we, pro well, we provide a linear time algorithm for doing this. And what it basically boils down to finding a suitable stabilizer of the state produced by the circuit. So we're just looking for a stabilizer that essentially flips these bits that need to be flipped. OK, so that's the, uh, that's the simulation algorithm. Uh, there are two other results that I want to mention before wrapping up. So we also consider a version of the graph state simulation problem 
where some qubits need to be post-selected, and then the goal is to sample from the conditional distribution. And we give an algorithm with the same runtime for doing that. Unfortunately, the correction subroutine is a little bit more complicated. But interestingly, it turns out to be equivalent to solving AX equals B when A is the adjacency matrix of a planar graph. And this extends the result of Alon and Yuster, who provide an algorithm with the same runtime, but it required that A was non-singular. So in our case, if A is singular, we'll give you a random uh, solution. And then there's also this thing called a Clifford tensor network, and we provide an algorithm for finding a non-zero element of that. And with that, I'll just conclude with this rather wordy summary slide. Um, one open problem that I, I would like to point out is that since our algorithm only works, or we only get this runtime of n to the omega over 2 for planar graphs, the graph state simulation problem on sparse but non-planar graphs is still a candidate for having a quantum speedup. OK, thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, for your nice talk. So there is a question by Yifan Jia, and she's asking about the idea of this nested dissection. Is this, uh, this section restricted to 2D grids, or maybe you can extend it to 3D or something like that? Um, yes, so our, our grid algorithm does generalize to 3D grids, but the exact runtime escapes me right now, but because the side lengths of the grid are now going to be the cube root of n, um, the scaling is somehow different, but I, I forget exactly what it is. Okay, so there is a question by Cedric Lean, and uh, which is as follows. Do you have any runtime lower bounds? Um, do we have any runtime lower bounds in the, let's see, I do not think we do. I do not think there are any, no. Yeah, I'm not aware of any, but I would be interested in talking about that maybe at the round table, because that seems interesting. Okay. And there is this question by uh, Sirim Vasan. And OK, do you think uh, one could generalize your simulation algorithm possibly with an exponential prefactor in t count? Yes, so that's another. I should have mentioned this as an open problem as well. Um, another thing that we've been discussing a little bit is the idea of using stabilizer rank methods in conjunction with this. So in stabilizer rank methods, you decompose the, the non-Clifford parts of the circuit into a sum of Cliffords, and then you simulate each term separately. And it looks like that does work, although it works a little better for strong simulation. So uh, computing output probabilities rather than sampling from the distribution. I'm not sure if it works very well for actually sampling from the distribution. Okay, thank you so much, Alex. So the, there's not any further questions in the Slack channel, but maybe maybe you can uh, answer the questions in the round table after the session. Okay, so, great. and every other person uh, can join the round table session uh, at uh, 8.30 and uh, the uh, CE time. And uh, for that, you have to press this round table session button at the end of the screen. Uh, so, uh, Alex, 